So I lived in Southern California, in a town that's a cross between a suburb and a city. On the many streets, there is one that is particularly long and notorious for having prostitutes walk around at night every so often. Not that I know anything about prostitutes, but I have seen scantily cad ladies walking around in fake designer heels and wear. At night, when there are barely any cars on the road. Anyway, I was about 20 when this happened to me, and I was around five foot nine. My suburb is about two blocks away from the convenience store, literally down the street. And as I've done many times before, I went there around midnight to buy hot Cheetos and other chips so I can get back to gaming. I was the type that stayed up late and loved walking around at night since it was cooler and there were less people around. Also, my family was in another state, so I lived alone at this point. This night it wasn't cold. It was summertime and so I walked out in shorts, flip-flops and a t-shirt. As I said, I do this often because I'd lived my whole life there and never felt unsafe walking around. Most people mind their own business, and it was fairly suburban, so police typically patrolled the roads. Anyway, I go to the store, buy my chips and something to drink, and then leave. As I'm on my way back, almost halfway, I finish crossing this small street, the kind that leads into a ring of private businesses and firms. This car pulls up to me, and I wish I'd paid more attention. But it was dark, and I didn't see anything to identify the car. I was close to the passenger side, and there was this man, also in the shroud of darkness, asking me for directions. The stranger starts. Hey, do you know where the 22 freeway is? Which way are you going, east or west? Uh, west? Oh, go down the road, then make a right. Then go all the way down and make a left turn after you see the freeway. Uh, okay, thank you. You're such a nice boy, do you need a ride? Uh, no, that's okay, I just live right down there. And I made a pointing motion into the general vicinity of my neighborhood. Mind you, this was very stupid, and I was hoping he'd let me go after that. Oh, are you sure? You can come in, I'll drive you. Uh, no thanks, I'll be fine. Then he moves his car, does a little U-turn and stops. Now the driver is facing me, and I couldn't see his face. Come on, get in. You're such a sweet boy. I was starting to get uncomfortable, without trying to lose my calm demeanor, because I was going to lose my shit and run at that moment. I declined again and started walking. I get that I may have been a little underdressed for the outside, but damn. I didn't look like a prostitute or anything. He keeps calling out to me, but I start paying no attention and go even faster. Eventually I turn back and his car had gone. I immediately call my friend telling him exactly what had happened and told him to call me in the morning to make sure I was all right. For a few months, I stopped walking out at night. Then when I felt it was safe, I returned to my old habit. Months after this point, at about 2 or 3 a.m., I begin to notice a car, or multiple cars, drive around my neighborhood. At some point, a car even hit the brake outside the entrance to my neighborhood and pulled in. I was coincidentally walking, and the car would slowly veer past me, then go down the street and return. I don't know if these incidences are connected or if I'm being super paranoid, but I found it very creepy. This story is one I haven't shared in detail to more than a few people. Be aware, it does involve assault. I am a 24 year old female that really doesn't get out much. A few friends and I are involved in theatre. I never really got to go 
as they are late and my husband works really early shifts. I decided I would go anyway, as I hadn't been before. I need to let you know a few details about this group. It's run by a drag queen that does rock shows and some plays in between sets. My female friend is a dancer for the show and does plays with her husband. So it's 80s themed and I go all dolled up with flashy makeup, Yego pants, a bright top and of course my hair was teased like crazy. I'd been to the venue before for rock shows before so I knew the setup. I grabbed a non-alcoholic coke which made the bartender and I chuckle and there's no food here and I had to drive so I was not planning to play that game. With the medication I take I'm mega lightweight anyway. So the show starts with a rock session. It's just me and four other people. They're not terrible but not what I would listen to and honestly the drag queen pretending to suck off the guitarist was not the best and they looked quite uncomfortable. I figured it's what they do and guess they were okay with it. But they looked bothered to me and was hard to watch. So then my male friend has to go get ready on stage and I'm alone for a bit before my female friend comes back to watch the play. The whole play happens, which was The Breakfast Club, and not really my thing. I came there to support them though, so I was still going to clap and cheer regardless. I see the time, and it's midnight, so there was no leaving early, as I consider downtown not safe for a single person after 10pm. Now, this is the moment I should have said screw it, and called my husband to pick me up anyway. But instead, I just got a rum and coke and waited out for the show to end so they can get me to my car. So the drag queen's husband is super excited to meet me because I'm friends with people in the show and he's never met me before. So far, just fine. I noticed he's definitely drunk as hell, but he wanted to be in picture so I was like whatever and took one. He hugged me from behind very tightly and pressed himself against me. Now I'm pretty short and he was just the right height that his bulge was on my ass. I took that picture fast and said I had to pee and got away from him. I figured he was just being eccentric and probably didn't realize what he had done. This would be the second time I considered calling my husband, but I'm stubborn and I wanted to not need someone for once. I just went back out and he was nowhere to be found. So I was like, great, a fantastic opportunity and went back to the one seat. The show starts and he's by me again with a few other people. He tells us, I know I love dick, but I still love boobies followed by touching the top of my breasts. So now I'm mega uncomfortable, and so is the other woman near me. He goes to touch my breasts again, and I'm just awkwardly getting away from him. He buggers off for more alcohol, like he needs it at this point, and he already smelt like a bloody distillery. At this point I'm thinking, shit, what if he follows me outside? What if he's not so much gay as he is bi? Maybe the homeless guys follow me around or some creep mugging me is better than dealing with this. I pulled myself together because that clearly would be worse. I go to get close to people I actually know and he kind of backs off. I figured I'm next to my friends and he kind just frolics amongst himself hitting himself on walls and falling over and giggling as he did so. I figured we are backstage in a room with everyone and I'll be fine as it's a small room. They're discussing stuff and I'm just trying to get through this without another encounter with the drunken man. When he suddenly jumps up again and grabs my boobs, pinching my nipples hard and giggling and leaving the room. 
No one even noticed. I just froze, wondering why no one else saw this. I started having a panic attack and silently focused on breathing. I somehow kept myself from freaking out. I knew that if I let my panic attack like that materialize, I wouldn't be able to drive. I stayed right next to my friend at that point, because I needed something to maybe keep him from touching me. My anxiety kept screaming. If I say what happened, I might not be believed or told I'm homophobic. Thanks, Brain. He brushes his hand on mine and then grabs my boob. I grab his hand and pull him off and say, these are my husband's, not yours, to touch. I was very loud and very stern and practically ready to hurt him at this point. He just giggled and said okay and walked away. They heard and saw this and said nothing. I was just in shock again. How could someone see that and do nothing? I felt like I was invisible. Then they decided to sit around and smoke weed. I debated calling the cops, but for some reason thought I couldn't get myself to. I was just silently panicking, and my anxiety kept saying that if you called them, all the people in this room except my two friends will be arrested for possessing weed. I don't know why, but I kept thinking of dumb things like not hurting my friends by being bothered or preventing people who think this behavior is okay from getting a ride to the police station. But again, thanks Brain. I assume this is the point I hit fight or flight. I just wanted a safe escort to my car and drive home. I finally got out of there. My friends take me to my car and I drive home spamming loud music. Just numb. Not scared, not upset, just feeling numb with trembling hands. I get home and my husband wakes up and asks me how the night was. And I just cried. I felt disgusting. All I could smell was weed and booze and I couldn't even handle my husband touching me. I just curled up into a ball and did my best to sleep. I had trouble telling my friends the next day as they talked about him and I found out he's never gone that far but he touches the showgirl's boobs all the time and that it's kind of normal. It took me months of therapy to think of it without crying. Weeks to be okay with my husband touching me. And to this day, I still don't understand why he put his hands on me. If they knew he did this, why didn't they warn me? And how could you get to a point where it's okay touching someone's private parts? Why would that work with other people? Wouldn't it be the right thing to encourage me to call the authorities and have reported it? Would it have been the right thing to report the other instances before it happened? Would he go further than this? I don't know the answer to these questions. I don't know why I froze at the time. All I know is I can't stand any of my friend's shows because I will in a way be supporting them as well. My husband is super protective now and I hope he doesn't meet the man for his sakes. My husband isn't ripped, but he would easily hurt the scrawny dude, and I don't need him getting in trouble like that. I don't trust anything now. I've always had bad anxiety, avoid confrontation, and I never let anyone stand too close to me for too long, if I don't know them. I also don't go anywhere without my husband unless I know I have someone else to trust around me. For me, fear in a movie, story or manifestation has nothing to do with the fear of being violated or unsafe. Don't be afraid to grab someone or push them away if they're making you uncomfortable. As my therapist said, you will never be prepared for this, so there's no guarantee you can protect yourself. But you should never be a doormat. No one deserves to be treated like that. You should always respect yourself and expect the same from others. This is the scariest episode from my childhood. It took place in 1991, when I was eight years old. I lived in a village on the Norwegian countryside, and my parents and my two older brothers lived there with me. There weren't many kids around for us to play with, 
so we would always be stuck together, despite the age difference. I was eight, and my brothers were ten and twelve, respectively. It was a safe neighborhood, and we were outdoorsy kids. It was fine for us to just return home to eat and then go back out again to play in the woods or go fishing in the nearby lake. In the autumn of 1991, my oldest brother dared us to sneak through the hedge to the abandoned property that was located close by. We had always thought of it as a haunted house, but really, it was the old house where the man who started the village brick factory once lived. No one had lived there for ages, and the paint was starting to peel off, and several windows were broken. Our parents would always tell us to never go in there. Their reason was, of course, that they feared that we would get hurt whilst playing there. But we thought, it was simply because the house was haunted. But that day, we dared to walk around in the garden, or what you want to call it. It had a now dried up pond as well, and several old and dying fruit trees, and even tools in an old shed. It looked as if someone had just walked out one day and never returned leaving everything as it was. We soon came to think of the garden as ours, and we played there all the time. We climbed the trees, used the tools to build things. It was great, our very own secret playground. We suspected that people in the village had seen us, because soon our parents would ask us if we had gone there despite being strictly forbidden which of course we denied. But someone must have complained. We were rather loud and untamed kids. Until one day, it was November. I remember since it was the day before my birthday. It was a damp and rainy day, and we weren't really in the mood for playing outside. But our mom had chased us out the house so that she could clean in peace and we wouldn't be allowed back until an hour later. So we decided to try and open the old cellar. We opened the doors and climbed down to have a look. The plan was to write our names on the inside of the cellar and mark it as our own. Suddenly, the hatch slammed shut above us and the cellar became completely dark. I started screaming, and my older brothers tried to open the hatch, when my oldest brother pushed the hatch open, and he saw a man's hand holding a small axe. Come on out, trespassing little brats. The axe close to the opening of the hatch. Hell no, shouted my brother and slam the hatch shut from the inside. All right, little brats. I know you're all in there. All three of you little shits. Does your mummy know where you are? Does she? I bet she doesn't. No one will look for you. We heard him dropping the axe and starting to move around with something. We soon realized that he had taken a hammer and before we knew it, he had started to nail the hatch closed. I threw myself at the hatch, determined to get out. But the moment the hatch opened just a tiny bit, he reached for the axe. Come on now, come on out. It's the better choice, really. It must be awfully dark and damp in there. Aren't you afraid of the dark? Go on, let your little brother out. He laughed and we could clearly hear that he was drunk. My older brother was pleading with the man to let us go, promising that we would never return. 
but his words fell on deaf ears. The rain had started to fall really heavily now, and we had heard thunder outside. The drunk man with the hammer was cursing and moving around outside, clearly bothered by the bad weather. I might come back to let you out one day, or maybe I'll butcher all three of you, he said through the wooden doors as he hammered the hatch shut. We were too terrified to do anything, but my older brother told us to stay calm and it would be okay, as surely he was just out to scare us. The dark was compact inside the cellar, and it was cold and damp, and after a long while of silence from the man outside, we started to wonder if he'd left. My brother decided that we should count to a hundred, and then try to get out. We counted loudly, and then used our hands to find the hatch. It was definitely nailed shut, and my brother told us to feel the stone walls for loose stones, and we did, cutting our palms on the sharp edges. Eventually we did find one, and it was surprisingly easy to remove it from its place. The cellar was old, and it hadn't been tended to for ages, and the rainy climate of the Norwegian coastside had left the wooden hatch doors rather soft with age. The hardest thing was to reach up. The cellar was built in such a way that it was almost impossible to get a good forward motion going in order to break the wood. But fueled by panic and adrenaline, we broke the lower half open, being closest to the ground, and it was softer and easier to tear apart. We started digging the earth with our hands, creating a small opening out. Being the smallest, my brothers pushed me out of the cellar, and I could see the man was indeed gone. My brothers were too big to fit into the small opening, and they said I would have to get the hammer and get the hatch open. I was absolutely petrified the man would return with the axe and I would have to run, leaving my brothers to die, or stay to be slaughtered. At eight years old, I had no doubt that would have happened. I got the hammer, but couldn't get the nails out. So I used the hammer to simply break the hatch to pieces. Soon, we were all three of us running for dear life, across the garden and home, where our mum threw a fit over the state of our clothes and hands and demanded to know what we had been up to. Nothing, we lied, unsure of what to say. We never went back there again. We never even looked that way. The man with the axe? We had no idea who he was or where he came from. I wonder if he was just a drifter living in the abandoned house, not wanting noisy kids to disturb the peace. This is by far the most fearful episode of my life. We never told anyone about it. But every year, when me and my two brothers reunite in the family home for Christmas, we like to ask if there's any news about the ghost house down the street. If anyone has moved in yet. I am a 25 year old female. I was 23 at the time this took place. I had been a college student, but had to quit due to a major surgery in my leg. So I was unemployed and had just spent a few months recovering. I was finally off crutches, but still limping around and lived in an old Victorian two-story house that is now a duplex. I live on the ground floor, and a middle-aged reclusive woman occupies the whole second floor. There are separate outside entrances, you see. And I live with a male housemate that was also a friend that is a few years older than me, and was employed as a security guard at a local casino. Our street is known for being seedy, and not a good neighborhood. But I've always felt pretty safe, never had too much trouble. One night, 
As I was home with my roommate and my boyfriend, we were all watching movies in the living room, which is out in the front of the house. My roommate's girlfriend then comes over drunk with another male friend of ours. The male friend sat down to watch movies with us and immediately passed out. And my roommate and his girlfriend went to his bedroom at the back of the house and immediately started having the most insanely loud intercourse I've ever heard. She always sounded like a trashy porn star. But anyway, a few minutes into the session, my boyfriend and I were still watching the movie, and we hear a loud scream coming from the back of the house. We couldn't distinguish what it was, maybe something getting knocked over, but we figured it was just my roommate and his girlfriend being extremely loud and all over the place. Eventually, they finished and the house was finally quiet. Our movie ended and we decided to go to bed in my room. My room is in the middle of the house and shares a wall with my roommate's wall and the living room on the other side. My bed was against the outside wall of my room parallel to an old window that slides up and down. The side and back of our house are pretty high off the ground. Looking out the window, it's a decent drop to the ground. Outside my window are vertical and horizontal beams that extend to hold up a little porch balcony for the lady upstairs. It really ruins the view having beams right there. My boyfriend went into my room and took off all of his clothes and jumped into bed. I started to take off my clothes too, but stopped. When I noticed the screens of my windows missing and it being open, I had a cat that at the time was indoor only. So my first thought was, the screen is missing. Striga must have gotten out of the window. Then I noticed that the window was pushed up way more than I thought possible. I kept thinking of my cat though. I was obsessed with keeping her inside. My first thought was to look under the bed and to see if she was maybe under there. It was dark, but I saw a black mass and reached out to grab her. And thankfully she was still inside. The black mass wasn't her. It was a black hoodie. And someone was in it. I had grabbed someone's arm. For some reason, my first thought at that moment was that a friend was playing a prank on me, and it was probably someone I knew. So I kind of laughed it off and said, Hey, there's someone under here. Then I lowered my face to meet his face. And... I realize I'd never seen this guy before in my life. This was not a friend and not a joke. I don't know this guy. I said in a less slightly calm voice. And my boyfriend was completely naked and told me to grab my gun as I was nearer to the closet than he was. Stay where you are, he screamed at the mass under the bed. The guy cooperated. I threw my boyfriend a robe and he put it on and jumped out of the bed near the closet where I was. He took the gun and pointed it at the bed and told the guy to come out slowly with his hands out. Since my roommate is a security guard, I ran to wake him up for backup. He rushed into the room and the three of us stood there with a teenage boy wearing a black hoodie coming out from under the bed. We were all kind of in shock and we started to question the kid who cooperated with us completely. He was being quiet and humble. His eyes shook violently from side to side, as if he was high or something. My roommate searched him. We emptied his pockets, and he had condoms, lube, porn advertisements from the back of a dirty magazine, and some dirty pills that he told us were Vicodin, but they were really just extra strength ibuprofen. He also had a pair of my dirty underwear in his pocket. Dirty underwear. That I had just had my period all over. That was the most disgusting part. 
We found ID on him as well, and a business card from a youth probation officer. So clearly he was a troublemaker. We also found a piece of paper with names and phone numbers on it that indicated he lived with his mother in a hotel room in a notorious drug motel that catered to prostitutes and meth. His high school ID was from Hooper High, and he was clearly from the local Hooper Native American tribe, or at least part Hooper Native. When we saw he had no weapons, we started questioning why he was in my bedroom under the bed with all that stuff, and asked if he realised how serious this was. He quietly replied that he had sex from the street and thought he could have some. Basically, he was a horny teenage boy on some sort of drug, riding his bike around at night, and my roommate's trashy girlfriend's sex noises were like a siren song in the night to this kid. He was so overcome by his horniness that he scaled the scaffolding and beams near my open window and crawled in under my bed, probably to masturbate, to what to he thought he was hearing in the next room. He probably jizzed on my underwear. He then kept apologising and saying he was sorry and God knows what. I was in shock and disgusted and wondered if he would have raped me if I'd have been alone. But we all felt a little compassion for the stupid kid. His fate was basically in our hands at that point, and we debated whether or not to call the police. We finally decided not to, and we basically lectured him and told him how lucky he was that he crawled into my window, and not someone else's, because we could have shot him or called the police and had him arrested, and whatever he was on for probation for would have been a lot worse. He kept thanking us and was super humble at that point. My roommate then escorted him out the front door and took his bike that he had left on the lawn and walked him to his shitty motel and watched him go inside. We kept all of his stuff. He didn't have money, just trash IDs and phone numbers and made sure to tell him we had his IDs and we knew where he lived. We had his mum's number and his probation officer's number and that if we ever saw him on the street again, he'd regret it. A drunk friend and my other roommate's girlfriend slept through the entire ordeal, and we told them next morning what had happened whilst they slept. This all happened a bit of a long time ago. I am 19 now, and in college. But I originally grew up in a small town in New England. The area is basically in the middle of a few game refuges and is surrounded by farms, fields, forests and mountains as far as the eye can see. It's beautiful in the fall, but can be annoyingly creepy at times. Honestly, there is a local legend about a Blair Witch cabin on the trail near my house that is legitimately a poker stop, but I digress. This all may seem irrelevant, but what you need to understand is that crime wasn't something that normally happened at all. There was the occasional car robbery, but they would usually just turn themselves in when they figured out that someone knew another person whose car they'd stolen, and they would get in more trouble with their mother than the authorities if they didn't turn themselves in. Yeah, it's that kind of town. We all felt safe, generally. My mum was always overly cautious. She always walked my brother, sister and myself to the end of the street while we waited for the bus to pick us up from school. We didn't mind too much, as we always lived on a street that literally had no other kids. It was, and still is, all just older people. It was like having about nine extra grandparents who would often give us sweets and other goodies. That being said, 
We didn't really play with any other kids on a regular basis. We normally just read books to entertain ourselves. So you can understand that we liked having our mother to talk to while we waited for the bus. If I got the year right, my brother was about nine at the time, my sister five, and myself seven. So we were young, but not incredibly so. Not to sound completely narcissistic, but we basically looked like the perfect set of children. My brother and I looked like twins, all smiles and both of our two front teeth missing. And my sister was the picture perfect of rosy cheeks and cherry sundresses. She would actually be stopped occasionally on vacation to take pictures with Japanese tourists who thought she was a little model toddler. One day, on our way to the bus, we opened the side door of our house and saw a small pile of pennies on the doormat. We were thrilled, as we thought the leprechaun had come to give us more coins, as a family friend had shared one of their family traditions with us just the previous week. If you leave a potato on your doorstep on the eve of St. Patrick's Day, the leprechaun will leave you with a stack of coins in exchange for his favourite meal. The whole idea of getting money, which was a measly 27 cents, was exciting for us, and we were all happy to take the coins. Our mum didn't see a problem with it, and assumed that her dad had left them there before he went to work early that morning. No one really suspected anything at the time. Naturally though, we all know that's total bullshit. For the next couple of weeks, the piles kept showing up on our doorstep and slowly began to trail down the driveway, stopping at the end for a few days, before trailing down the street to where our bus stop usually stops every morning. At this point, my parents began freaking out, and rightly so, after discovering that my dad hadn't left the pile of coins. So they began to ask the sweet elderly neighbours whether or not it had been them, and every single one of them said no. We stopped taking the coins after that. The pile of coins at the end of the street grew and grew in size over the next few weeks. This had been going on for about a month at this point, and the coins were always there, and they were clearly meant for us. But no one was in sight. You're probably wondering why my parents didn't call the police at this point. Well, they didn't want to cause them any trouble. My mother's words, not my own. One day, however, we did end up having to call. We were all standing at the end of the road, besides the ominous pile of coins, when a grey sedan pulls up from behind the tree line and parked across the road from our street. We would have thought this was normal, as many people park there to take hikes, but the car had no plates. The only way this vehicle could have been more nondescript would have been if it were painted camouflage. The clincher for us was the red scarf we saw tied to the car's side mirror. It was the same one that we had tied on our mailbox to let the bus driver know if we were all sick and wouldn't be coming into school that day and it had been stolen months ago. An investigation took place, and nothing really came of it. But once the police began monitoring the house, the coins stopped coming, and the car never returned. If my mother wasn't as careful with us as she was, 
we would have been kidnapped faster than you can blink. After talking about it more, we came to the conclusion that he was probably after my baby sister, the one with the wide eyes and perfect apple plum cheeks. She's 16 now and can't remember any of this, but it's honestly terrifying to think about how she, my little sister, could have been gone forever. The part that scares me the most about this is that the guy wasn't your usual kidnapper. He was patient. He waited for months and months to try and get his hands on us. He watched our house, our family, learnt our rituals and was trying to find an opportunity. He watched us walk to the end of the street every morning for the bus. He knew when we were sick and he saw us leave the potato out on the doorstep for the leprechaun, and then he knew how to reel us in. The asshole knew everything, and will never know how. Soon after, our dad thought it would be safer for us to have self-defense classes. And although it may sound like I'm making this up, my siblings and I have all trained in Shaolin Kempo, two of us sporting second degree black belts. Basically, my tiny sister could throw a grown man over her shoulder at the age of 11. I don't really want to know where the douchebag is, but don't let any kids fall for the coin trick, like we almost did. I was 14 when this occurred, and I am 22 now. But I still remember it in crisp detail, and it freaks me out to this day, thinking about what would have happened if things turned out differently. School was out for the summer, and I had convinced my mum to send me to Russia for a few months to visit my grandparents. We moved to North America when I was little, and I hadn't been back much since. Plus, I thought it would be fun being on my first trip abroad by myself. She agreed, and off I went on my first solo transatlantic journey. My grandparents are great people, and have always spoiled me and my mother rotten. And they were ecstatic that their only granddaughter wanted to visit. So they planned a little vacation of their own with me a few months after I arrived to a popular beach resort in the city of Turkey. We were to stay at a five-star resort in Ankara for two weeks. I thought that this was spectacular, getting to travel to not one but two countries in one summer, and to a fancy and exotic place like Turkey too. I was dying to go. But Full disclosure, when I arrived to Russia, it wasn't really what I was expecting. My grandparents are really protective people, and I couldn't do much or go anywhere by myself. So it got boring pretty fast, and I spent most of my days playing PSP in my room. I had also got accustomed to being active and wanted to do things like go jogging, which I did every day at home. So I gave my grandparents a hard time because they wouldn't let me go out alone and naturally they couldn't keep up. Then after about a month's time, the time came for us to go to Turkey and I was super excited to finally get some freedom and a change of scenery. I had been pent up at home for far too long. The resort they had picked was sprawled over a pretty large area. However, it was all very well secured and isolated from the rest of the city. And there was also a huge garden on the property, which was ideally suited for jogging. This time, I had my own room 
separate from my grandparents. So I took this chance to go off by myself and explore the grounds. Most of the time, I would jog in the mornings, when it was cooler, with my big old iPod. So I couldn't hear anything that was going on around me. But I figured it was pretty safe, since it was a nice hotel with plenty of tourists. Then I started to notice him. A pretty, innocuous seeming gardener in his late forties in a green uniform. I remember he looked like a shriveled old date from too many years in the sun. He would always wave or say something to me in broken English as I passed by him whilst he trimmed the shrubs or mowed the lawn or whatever. I would politely wave back, smile or nod, but didn't really pay much attention. Fast forward about 10 days and I was really enjoying myself. It was fun to swim in the pool and the sea. The food was great, and my grandparents had let up a lot, so I could do more by myself. However, they didn't know about my morning runs in the garden, and I wasn't going to tell them, because I wasn't sure that they would approve. So one morning at around 7am while I'm jogging, I see the gardener again. But this time it's clear he's trying to get my attention. He waves at me and yells something. So I stop and pull out my earphones, trying to figure out what he wants. Now, I know he works for the hotel, so I really don't suspect anything. He waves at me again and motions for me to come forward. I'm confused. But I figure he wants to tell me something, so I politely approach. He's standing at the trail that goes deeper into the gardens and foliage. He's smiling and gesturing. And I can see him holding something in his hand. Rosa. Beautiful Rosa. I notice he's holding a rose, and it extends it to me. At this point I'm confused and a little freaked out about what the hell he's thinking. But I stay put. Usually the hotel staff there are chatty and nice enough. My grandparents would always get pulled into conversations with them about things. I figure it's something like this now, and I don't want to be rude, but still want to be on my way without offending the old man. He hands the flower to me and I take it. I think maybe he wants to show me some roses that are in bloom, but he keeps waving and gesturing, like he wants me to follow him. And stupidly, I walk closer. He has another flower in his hand and he backs away more. Then suddenly, he stops and starts to lower it a little. That's when I notice he's holding something in his other hand as well. I look up ahead towards the trail and see a little cabin type thing where I assume they keep the gardening supplies. Something clicks in my head and then I back away instantly. He sees me doing that and tries to smile saying Rosa again and moves the hand he's been holding behind his back while lurching towards me. That's when I see he's holding some kind of rag. Without hesitation, I drop the rose he handed to me, turn around and run for it at full speed. I don't stop to look back and run like mad back to the hotel. It's not until the doors close behind me and I'm among other people that I look back to see if he'd followed me. I don't see him anymore and my heart is beating like crazy. I go back to my hotel room and wait for my grandparents to wake up. I never told them anything of what happened that day, and spent the rest of my vacation glued to their side. I thought that if I'd say anything, they would get even more paranoid about my safety, and blame me for wandering off on my own. Also, I didn't want to ruin the remaining days for them.
I saw the gardener once more at the beach. I remember him talking to a security guard. I remember growing very uncomfortable and sinking into my sun chair when I saw him. Then he looked at me and smiled. I scowled at him and he mouthed the word Rosa tauntingly and smiled again with a sick, malicious grin. I still remember the anger bumbling in my stomach and how much I wanted to cleave his face in. But I just froze and stared. He walked away and I went back to pretending nothing ever happened. Needless to say, I never went on any more morning jogs and neither did I want to until long after the summer had ended and I'd returned back home. The past few years, I've had seasonal jobs which allow me to go to pretty cool places and camp all summer. And during winter, housing is provided. Because of this, I do not rent or own a home. I just go from my tent to free housing. I'm a guy in my mid-twenties, so what do you expect? September to October though is the tricky time as I have no housing and it's getting cold out. Rewind to last October. I have a few weeks until my winter job starts, so I am biding my time with a mix of camping and crashing at friends' houses. After going to a friend's wedding, I came down with some sort of insane flu. I rarely get sick, but this was as bad as anything I've experienced. So I decided I would just splurge on a motel room for a night or two. My voice is nearly gone. Insane sore throat, cold sweat, body aches, the whole shebang. I found a decent priced, not roamed down motel. The kind when your door opens to the outside and not the hallway. I take a long hot bath, get curled up in bed, and I am very satisfied with my choice to get a room. And this is where it gets weird. I hear the room next to mine open up, and the door slams. The guy inside is on the phone, and is furious with someone. He is literally screaming into the phone, saying he's going to blow up someone's truck. How could you do this to me, etc, etc. From listening in, you could tell that he had been fired from his job, and he was talking to his boss. The whole time, I hear things being smashed, walls being punched, more screaming, and this is where most people would call the cops. But I am not most people. I had already smoked some pot in the room. Come on, I'm sick as a dog, what do you expect? And I didn't want to deal with the authorities. And then suddenly I heard a huge crash, and legitimately thought the guy may have tried to hang himself. At this point, it is a bit later at night, maybe nine or so, and I am sitting in the bed having just smoked a bit more pot to ease the pains surging through my body. And I'm thankful the bastard is not screaming into his iPhone, or breaking things at the moon. As I begin to drift off to sleep, I hear a very soft tap, tap, tap. I ignore it, assuming the guy next door is trying to repair something he broke in his rage. Tap, tap, tap. This time louder, and the tapping gets louder still. It's loud enough for my dog to bark. I look up and look through the peephole. And no one's there. I go back to bed and the tapping resumes. And by now I have two emotions. The first is that I'm pissed that someone is messing with me sleeping whilst being sick. And the second is paranoia. Because I'm high and my room probably smells a lot like pot. Then I hear someone say very softly, Bro, let me smoke some. I quickly realise I can either open the door and deal with this, 
or risk having this person getting pissed and calling the cops. Obviously, dealing with an unstable psychopath is better than the cops, right? As I go to open the door, it slams open in my face, and a guy in maybe his mid-thirties pushes me aside and comes in. Before I can react, I notice he has an opened knife in his hand. Shit. He immediately starts asking unsettling questions. Who else is in the room? I tell him just me and the dog, and he says, bullshit. Who the hell else is in here? It's very clearly just me, but I could see that he's an unstable individual. Whether he's off on his meds or on some kind of meth, I'm not sure. He proceeds to make me show him the bathroom, proving there's no one else there, while mourning me of consequences if I were to lie. The whole time, I'm debating my options, keeping in mind I'm as sick as a dog, high, and have taken some NyQuil, and basically, I'm thoroughly out of it. Once he verified the place was empty, he goes on a new tangent all while holding his dear knife and threatening my dog. Do you have any idea who I am? He kept asking. He goes on to say he's undercover FBI, and that I'm in deep shit if I don't cooperate. This whole thing had gone on for maybe 15 minutes, and I had begun to see this probably wasn't going to end very well if I didn't change my strategy of letting him talk. I tell him it seems weird for an FBI agent to barge into a room wanting pot and holding a hunting knife. He responds to that by stabbing his knife in the table and telling me that I don't know shit about federal investigations. And it became more and more clear this guy was a moron, albeit a potentially violent one. In a last ditch effort, I say something to the effect of I don't know why you're doing this. If you want to smoke some pot, okay. But otherwise, I'm sick as hell and want to go to bed. He then proceeds to make me load the bowl and take the first hit to confirm that the pot was unpoisoned. He took a hit and it was very clear he'd never smoked out of a bowl as I had to show him the card and where to light, etc. He takes a hit coughs his lungs out, then smiles and tries to give me a hug, folds up his knife and asks if I want to go to the bar. I remind him I'm very sick, which is evident by the fact I can only whisper, and he shakes his head, almost embarrassed, and leaves. His room was silent for the rest of the night, so the pot must have helped him calm down. The rest of the night, I laid there wondering if that had just really happened, or if I was hallucinating. In the morning, the mark the knife had left on the table verified that yes, I had just smoked pot with an insane knife-wielding maniac. I know that a lot of you would say I'm an idiot for smoking pot in my room in the first place, to which I can only say it was a calculated risk. I knew the smell would be gone by morning, so housekeepers wouldn't notice, and being in a state with plenty of medical marijuana, people are fairly friendly towards it. I opted to smoke a bit to ease my pain and discomfort, and it certainly worked, short of attracting a possible knife to the face. This story happened around a year ago, when I was 22. My friend Samantha lived a few streets down at the time and would sometimes have people stay over at her apartment. Now, my friend Samantha is probably one of the sweetest girls I've ever met. She's very welcoming to new people and never judged anyone on first appearances. However, she could be a bit naive when it came to opening up to strangers. So I was a little apprehensive when she said she was letting a group of crust punks, which are hipster kids choosing to be homeless because it's cool, stay with her for a week. Anyway, 
I realized my judgment was 80% wrong when I met her new friends. There were five guys. Four out of five of the guys were very nice, fun, and harmless. I really enjoyed getting to know the four guys, and felt bad that I had been so very quick to judge. But then, there was Sparrow. Sparrow had long, stringy hair, a bony figure, and a dirty, unkept face, and a beastly odour of rotten fruit and unwashed dick. But what do you expect from a homeless kid? Sparrow seemed to stand out in the group, as he was older, somewhere in his thirties, and he was hanging with a group of people in their late teens and early twenties. Sparrow was very obnoxious for many reasons. He talked most of the time about pretentious, pseudo-hippie shit. Like, I'm better than you, because I've learned the meaning of life through yoga and eating my own organic vegan poop. He would constantly interrupt and talk over others. He would always disagree with everything anyone ever said even if it made no sense. For example, if someone said something like, I like cheese, he would respond with, no you don't. Cheese is your enemy, ruled by fascist capitalist bigwigs, you dumb shit. All the while, chewing corporately owned bubblicious bubblegum. If he was tired of hearing you, and wanted to hear his own voice again, he would say something along the lines of, I grow tired of your conversation. And that was his way of politely telling someone to shut up. Later, we decided to go back to my place to chill for an hour before Samantha had to leave for work. When Samantha says it's time to go, the four friendly guys say goodbye and leave. Sparrow, however, tries to stay while the rest are leaving. Come on, let's hang out here some more, whined Sparrow. I want to get to know you. Both me and Samantha are looking at each other, concerned and creeped out. I tell him I need to work on school, but he doesn't back down. After seven minutes of us telling him that he needs to leave, she puts him back and I shut the door. I found out later right after my door shut, that Sparrow turned to Samantha and hissed, Why are you trying to cock-block me? Lol. This smelly homeless guy really thought he had a chance with me? Delusional. After they leave, I notice a fresh wad of chewing gum stuck in my living room rug. I immediately knew it was Sparrow, as he had been the only one chewing gum the entire time I was there. I grudgingly clean it up and go back to working on homework. The next morning, I'm getting out of the shower when I hear a knock on the balcony door. To give you an idea of what my apartment is like, it basically has a glass door leading to the balcony. I'm on the second story, but it's still easy to climb up. When I hear the knock, I'm alarmed because no one normally would ever climb the balcony just to say hi. They could use the front door, or even the back door, but no. Someone thought it would be a good idea to just climb up into my balcony and knock on that door. I turn around the corner of the bathroom, and guess who I see? Sparrow is peering inside, and mouthing what looks like a question. I jump back into the bathroom, and wrap a towel around myself, hoping he didn't see me naked. When I get to the door, I can hear him asking if his phone was there. I turn around and sure enough, some random phone plugged into one of the outlets was left there. I stupidly let him in and hand him his phone and charger. As soon as he sees me in a town, he smiles and says, Wow, you look sexy. He comes up close to me facing me, trying to press his odiferous body against mine, and he says, 
Do you wanna... You know. While bobbing his eyebrows up and down. I give him a look of complete and utter repulsion and say... No! Oh God, no! Apparently he doesn't hear me. Because he keeps pressing up against me. Trying to make me drop the towel, saying... Come on, let's do it. And stuff along those lines. At this point, he is attempting to wrap his arm around me, pushing me backwards. Fortunately, the front door is right next to the bathroom door, and he's close enough for me to open the door and push his frail figure out. I quickly shove him out the front door and say, No, piss off, while slamming the door in his face. I'm freaking out. But relieved that I was able to get him out of my apartment. About 10 minutes later, I get a text from an unknown number. The text says something to the effect of, there's nothing wrong with two friends having fun. Are you sure you don't want me to come over? I say no. And he responds with, wow, you don't have to be such a prude, you know. I proceed to call him smelly and tell him to piss off. And he doesn't respond after that. Shortly after the texts, I call Samantha and tell her what happened. Apparently the phone he was texting wasn't even his. It was his girlfriend's. Samantha is disgusted and proceeds to tell me that he has been aggressively hitting on girls 10 years younger than him the whole time he was there. Even with his girlfriend in tote. Samantha and the others have been trying to ditch him all week. And this was the final straw. She proceeded to kick him and his girlfriend out. I'm glad that Samantha handled the situation the way she did. To Sparrow, wherever you are, I hope we never meet again. This happened to me not too long ago. Perhaps at the beginning of the school year. I am a sophomore girl in high school. And I live in a pretty calm state, with not much crime and not many creepy people. It's Idaho for Christ's sake. I believe the scariest thing that can happen here is a potato famine. At the beginning of the year, I didn't have an efficient way home. I live a couple of miles away from my school and the hot summer weather isn't quite my definition of optimal to walk in. I only live with my mum and she works until five. Since school gets out at around three and I wasn't aware that there was a bus going to my house, I could always chill at the park right next to my school and just wait for my mother to pick me up. There weren't very many people at the park ever unless it was for summer break. A few elementary kids with their parents here and there. Some people from my school walking on the canal nearby or getting to their cars and a lot of LARPers. Every day, I'd sit at the same spot doing homework or something and waiting for my mum. Rarely anyone sat where I did. Even though there were four long benches under the gazebo I was sitting at. One day, I'm walking up the hill to the park, and at my usual place, I saw a man sitting on the bench across from mine. The park was mostly empty except for him and I, but it was open enough for anyone to see if anything went down. As I neared the bench, I saw he was wearing an all-purple suit and a fedora, despite the agonizingly hot weather. This man still had the capacity to wear a full-on long sleeve suit and pants, and to top it all off, a fedora. Nothing about him tipped me off at that point, except for the fact that he was staring at me as I inched closer. I swear his eyes wouldn't rip away from me. And I set down my bag and tuned the music up on my phone, making it apparent through my headphones that I didn't want to talk. Typical 21st century teenager thing. 
I pulled my book out from my bag and began waiting for my mum. An uneasy feeling settled only after I read a sentence from my book and looked up. The fedora guy was still staring at me. He looked around 30 or 40 and I could see a smile forming on his face. I shivered a bit, but brushed it off and continued reading. After only a few more sentences in my book, I looked up again, and there was a full smile on his face at this point, and it was starting to creep me out more than it was before. I turned my music up louder, because obviously that's how you get someone to leave you alone in a sophomore's mind. I went back to my book, but the feeling was still there. I began to clutch my bag for a fast escape, just in case this creep tried something. The feeling came back after I finished a page in my book. For some reason, I brushed it off, but into a sentence of the new page, I looked up again. Fedora guy was now right across from me on the other side of the bench. He was still doing that creepy grin thing, but his mouth was moving. I couldn't hear what he was saying at all through my headphones, and I had the feeling I didn't want to. But even after he was done talking, he stared at me, pointing to his ear as if gesturing for me to take out my headphones. Wide-eyed, and immensely creeped out. I did as so. My hand reached over to my bookmark and shut the book and began shoving it in my bag. The man reached his across the table, barely missing my hand, and I was starting to get up before he finally said something. Do you know what the sexual consent age in Idaho is? Dear God. His voice was really high and squeaky. He might have impaled a couple of ounces of helium. I got up and walked away without a word. When I looked back, he was still staring at me, but his creepy smile was gone. It had now been replaced with a menacing frown, and his eyebrows were furled, and his hands that almost touched me were formed into a fist. I was only a few feet away from him when I saw him stand up. My pace quickened as I walked up the hill. It had only been a few minutes since school got out and some of my peers were still lurking around the park. At a crosswalk, I spotted a distant acquaintance, for he was the only one in the vicinity that wasn't walking away. I explained the situation to him and we calmly joked about it but we were keeping an eye out for the purple fedora guy. A few minutes later, we saw him walking up the hill towards us. I nodded my head towards the man, and he understood. My distant acquaintance slightly shielded himself over me. Being five foot one has its advantages, including hiding easily behind virtually anything taller than me. The man stopped at the crosswalk, only a few feet away from us, not seeming to notice me. Once the street was cleared, he crossed the street and started walking onto the canal away from us. Just when I thought it was clear, he turned around and the smile was back on his face. For a few seconds, he kept walking forwards with his head slightly tilted at me until he disappeared. I could only see a bit of his smile but I knew it was still there when his head turned around. That was two or three weeks into the school year, and now there's only one day until school ends. I stopped going to the park every day after I saw him standing on the canal with the same purple suit, not even a week later. I began to ride the bus and catch rides from friends, but a few days ago, I was sticking around after school to finish a project. It was close to five when I finished, and my mum agreed to pick me up when I was done, unknowing of the event that took place eight months ago. She told me to wait in the park, and of course I'd gotten over the whole thing. But as I was back, in my old bench, I saw a purple suit with a fedora standing on the canal.
noped right out of there real fast. When I was 15, my dad got a new job in England. I'm of Scandinavian origin, and moved the family to London. Two years later, his job there was done, and he was ready to move back home. And he did, carelessly leaving me behind, since I was 17 and considered old enough to fend for myself. Not to mention I was a pretty horrible teen, so that might have played a part. But still, I got dumped here whilst my little sisters returned home. It wasn't all bad, because I got to move in with a classmate and her family, a large Catholic family, who saw it as their goal to get me back on track. Usually, their strategy included family dinners every night and asking me if I needed help with my schoolwork. Did I need anything knitted and so on? I played the part of the polite and dutiful surrogate daughter well, and I liked my life there very much, but I also enjoyed London nightlife. I never did drugs or anything, but I liked the thrill of being unsupervised in London at night. Being too young to get into most places, I decided that I couldn't wait and had to buy myself a fake ID. I had no idea how people acquired such things, but was pointed to a guy called Terrible Freddy, and that alone should have been a clue. Terrible Freddy was a tall, skinny guy who lingered around the clubs at night. Sure, I can help you. Give me a passport, three days, and the cash, and you will get an ID that can fool anyone. He promised. Ignoring my softly humming inner alarm bell, I handed him my passport. Ah, a Norwegian little lady, are you? Lovely. What brings you here? My family did. But then they left me and went back home, I said, trying to sound like I was in a really cool situation. Don't lose the passport, though. It's the only ID I've got, I said. Which... I was not entirely comfortable about letting go, but anyway. Terrible Freddy seemed intrigued by this information, and I could tell him stare at me as I walked away. Three days later, I went to Camden Market to get my new ID, and I spotted Freddy hanging around with some bigger blokes in a leather jacket, and another smaller but psychotic looking dude. The sight of them together made me uneasy. And later I can understand that it was because Freddy was always seen on his own. Bringing his posse was a new thing. And they all looked like they were on a mission. More remarkable than handing a fake ID to a teenage girl in exchange for some cash. I walked in a large circle around the market considering my options. He had my passport and possibly my ID, my ticket to the clubs. But the sight of the three men had caused an almost nauseating kind of fear in me, and I couldn't bring myself to walk over to them. And that's when he saw me. Gabby! Gabrielle! He shouted, waving and smiling for me to come over. So I started walking towards them, and saw the other two men he had been talking to just moments ago were now pretending not to know him. One taking an exaggerated interest in the fruit on sale, and the other watching intently from a distance. But his cheer size made it impossible for him not to be noticed. I got you papers in the car. It's over here. Walk with me, Gaps. He said it and reached out to take my hand, and in an act of pretend chivalry, completely out of character to him. He kissed my hand, and then proceeded to walk arm in arm with me, away from the crowded marketplace. He had a pretty firm grip on my arm, as I attempted to free myself, 
saying something about not being a damsel in distress. He locked his arm in an iron grip and started walking faster, while joking and talking. His voice seemed friendly and cheerful, his words kind and pleasant, but his body language was forceful and scared me. One of the last things my dad said before waving goodbye to me a few months earlier was, enjoy London life, but be smart. If something seems off, it's probably because it is. The sound of tyres screeching and the sight of a car driven by the man in the leather jacket was the last hint I needed to move. Let go of me, I shouted at the top of my lungs, determined to attract attention at any cost. This only led to the car stopping, and the huge bloke suddenly appeared as if he had been waiting somewhere close by. Grab her, Terrible Freddy said, and the large guy reached out to grab hold of me as a car came somewhere to halt in front of us. I threw myself on the ground, kicking and screaming, and causing the most absolute foulest noise and chaos I could. I didn't make the three men run away but it did attract the immediate attention of a homeless guy who shouted police so loudly it must have been heard all over the place. More people started to move in our direction and that's when the trio decided it wouldn't be worth the risk and got in the car and sped off. The icy, blue, goat-like eyes of terrible Freddy staring at me as they left. The homeless guy, Cody, stayed with me until the police actually arrived. But what could I report? That my attempt to buy a fake ID had misfired and that I was almost kidnapped for God knows what reasons? That my passport was now in the hands of possible traffickers? Yeah, should have reported all of that, but 17 year old me was too scared to do it. I stayed in London until the end of that school year then made my way back home. Not home to my family home, but home to Norway. I never told anyone what happened. So it's nice to get this off my chest now. Moral of the story is, be savvy. There are always dangerous parts in every city. And if you get involved in the wrong crowd, something bad is bound to happen. Be safe. My mum and I both work at very old, very haunted hotels. We used to be very open about it all, about our hauntings. But our current owner is a real jackass who refuses to acknowledge this, despite the business it could bring in. So we no longer put it in the brochures or broadcast it in any way. But I guess it makes it all the more convincing when guests tell us their crazy stories, as they usually have no prior knowledge of the hauntings or even of the history of the place, which is a real shame because the building has some serious connections to incredible people who played a major part in founding the country. So, a few weeks back, we were in the middle of our January lull. Every year during that month, a lot of us get laid off because we're not needed. So it's pretty quiet around here between the lack of both guests and employees. However, this night, we did have two guests check in, both of whom were local and they were celebrating a special occasion as the guy had flowers delivered to the room before they checked in. They went to the restaurant to eat dinner and then went to their rooms shortly after 9 p.m. At 10.45 p.m. My mom was startled to see them returning to the front desk with their luggage, looking pale and terrified. They were very reluctant to tell my mum what had happened, but said that they wanted to check out now and not wait until morning. My mum 
has seen this look on guests' faces before, and finally coaxed the truth out of the guy. Apparently, they had went to bed a bit after ten, and half an hour later, they got shot awake to a great crash and the sound of glass breaking. They scrambled out of bed and flipped the light switch on and couldn't believe what they saw. A massive, heavy glass lamp on the bedside table had been knocked off and onto the floor, where it lay in pieces next to the alarm clock as though someone had just taken their arm and swept the whole lot off in a rage. After seeing this, the couple grabbed their things and bolted out of the room. And when they were checking out, they were so embarrassed, they didn't even want a refund and refused my mum's offer to just move them to another room, even though it would have been a huge upgrade. The woman just kept saying, I want to sleep in my own bed tonight. And the guy told my mum, we may come back one day, but never again during the month of January, when the hotel is nearly empty. My mum apologised as best she could for the craziness, and checked them out, and she gave them a refund anyway, since they'd only used the room for a very short while. When they left, she and a co-worker immediately went to view the room and found everything was just as described. While they were marvelling at the strangeness of it all, a faint sound nearly scared them to death. It was the woman's cell phone, vibrating under the sheets. She'd left it in a frenzy to get out. They grabbed the phone and headed back to the front desk, where they were met by the guy coming to ask if they had found it, with his wife waiting in the car. He decided to open up a bit more to my mum about the incident, as his wife was already terrified, and he knew it would make it worse. He said that before they fell asleep, he had an uncomfortable and undeniable sense of dread, as though something was going to happen. And when the sound first woke him up. He looked towards the foot of the bed and saw the silhouette of his wife standing there. He asked if she was okay and heard her voice right next to him. She was on the bed. We've had people hear voices and music, see apparitions and capture incredible images on camera. One of which was a young man dressed in colonial era clothing. And you can see him clearly, down to his hair and belt. But for someone or something to sweep a lamp and clock off a table so hard it breaks the lamp is very unusual. Our phenomena is very rarely of the physical variety. So I'm not sure what to make of this. I myself have never been frightened of whatever is here. Maybe because I am a lover of history, I would almost welcome the prospect of seeing someone from such a long gone era. As to who the woman was that this guy saw at the foot of her bed, I have no idea. We have a very well known female spirit in the hotel, supposedly from the era when it was a civil war hospital. But the building also served as an elite college for women and of course, was a home when it was first built, so it could be anyone for all we know. It's a lame old... This story happened a year ago. I was living with my then boyfriend, and now fiancé. Anyway, we lived in a townhouse in the suburbs in a pretty safe area. There had been some robberies, a couple of blocks away, but they weren't common, and I felt pretty safe walking home alone at night. So one weekend, my boyfriend's brother Marshall and his girlfriend Amy and her brother Curtis were visiting. We were all just going to chill and have a couple of drinks 
and play video games and relax. My boyfriend had his last LSAT and after months of hard studying, he just wanted to relax before the exam. Unfortunately, I ended up getting very sick. It was the worst flu I ever had. Extremely high fever. One degree higher and I would have had to go to the hospital. Nausea, headache, body aches, all the good stuff. Of course, I didn't want to stop my friends from having a good time. So they came over anyway and I just stayed in my room. They went out to eat before they came over. So I was in bed alone watching TV, and felt like I was dying. I slept on and off, and at about 4pm, I heard the door open, and figured they were back, when I called out for my boyfriend and no one came. Even if he were there, he probably wouldn't have heard me, but I knew he'd come and check on me as soon as he came back, so I assumed I had just heard something fall or the neighbours were making noise. So I dismissed it and went back to sleep. I remember I was sleeping on my back. And in deep sleep, I groggily opened my eyes and thought I saw a figure move across my room. I was so heavily medicated and so sick, I didn't even fully understand what had happened and what that meant. Like I saw the figure, but it didn't connect in my brain that I may have seen someone. And since it was pretty dark in the room, I think part of me just thought it was the TV. Finally, around 7 p.m., everyone came back. They were loud. Amy, who was my brother's boyfriend's girlfriend, was very tipsy. And she's very fun when drunk. So there was a lot of laughter. My boyfriend came in to check on me. He brought me soup. He sat and talked about his day as I ate it. And I asked him to look in the basket under the bed to get me a new bottle of aspirin. We had a full size bed. And I had one small basket under the bed where I kept an extra bottle of pills, toothbrushes, shaving cream and stuff like that. I didn't know it right away. But thank God he looked under the bed. He put his head up and handed me the aspirin, but his facial expression changed, like he lost all the colour from his face. I didn't think much of it and said, thank you. He said, come on, I'm going to take you to the bathroom. He never stuttered. I was kind of out of it, but I remember picking up on it. I told him, no, I really didn't have to pee, and I didn't feel like getting up. And he said, no, let's go. I don't want to have to climb back up the stairs just in case you need a pee in 10 minutes. I remember feeling pretty hurt by these words, but he was right, since I just had soup and a bottle of water. He walked me downstairs and I couldn't understand why we couldn't just go to the bathroom upstairs. I think I was so sick I felt too exhausted to question it. He sat me on the couch. What's going on? I practically whispered, as my head was hurting a lot. He took out his phone, and his hands were shaking. I asked him what was wrong, and I will never forget how my heart sunk and I felt like I couldn't breathe when he whispered. There was someone under the bed. Amy laughed so hard. I laughed thinking it was a prank, but it felt serious. My boyfriend's brother suggested we get out of the house and so we did. And as we're leaving, we heard a thump upstairs. We quickly left, drove away and called the police. The police came and searched, but didn't find anyone. He must have known we suspected he was there. My boyfriend couldn't give any description, only that he saw sneakers. But it was so dark he really couldn't see. Scariest thing that still leaves me on edge is that the police found a knife under the bed. It was a small steak knife, but very dull and rusty. There weren't any killings in the area, 
So my friends assumed he just wanted a place to sleep. I'm not really sure how we got into our place, but I have some theories. I'm really proud of how my boyfriend handled everything. He's a calm and collected person, but I always assumed he wouldn't be that way in a crisis. I just hope I never see this person again. And since that incident, I now stuff loads of things under my bed for storage and to avoid this happening in future. This happened about five years ago, when I was 18 and living out of home for the first time while attending university in Australia. Instead of living on campus, I decided to get an apartment with two friends of mine, all three of us girls. We ended up with this sweet triple story house not too far from university. I had the master bedroom and it was on the second floor facing the street and it was long, like weirdly long for a bedroom that wasn't matched in width. When I first moved in, I had a lot of floor space on the account that I couldn't put much furniture in without the room too narrow to walk through. The door to the room was at one end and at the other end about four or five meters away, if I remember correctly, was the door to my private ensuite. And opposite that was the door to my private balcony, which, as it was on the second floor, and I was stupid, I never locked. Between the ensuite and the balcony was my bed. Eventually, I filled the room with furniture, mostly bookshelves, which meant two things. First, there were about 30 to 40 centimetre wide paths around my room with no other way around unless you started jumping on things. Second, that in order to make it seem less crowded, I stuck up a lot of mirrors. From any one point in the room, I could see myself reflected at least twice, sometimes three or four times. One night, I was in the shower and like usual, I hadn't closed my ensuite door fully. The vents were pretty terrible, so I liked to let out the steam while I was showering. If the door was open, I could see a little of my room from within the shower, and a little more if I angled myself just right and managed to catch a glimpse of one of the many mirrors. I was halfway through singing Don't Fear the Reaper by the Grateful Dead, when I happened to open my eyes and see, reflected in a mirror, a man in a red jumper lying under my bed. If you've ever going to piss yourself in fear, I fully recommend being in a shower. He had his face turned away while he was scratching his head. If he hadn't chosen that moment to scratch, I probably would have made eye contact with him and given myself away. If I hadn't been a theatre student with The Show Must Go On branded on my heart, then I probably would have screamed and given myself away even more. But instead, I swallowed my fear and kept singing. I made sure to move further back in the shower as well, so I wouldn't accidentally catch sight of him again and risk being caught noticing him. Because of the narrow paths through my room, and the fact that it was so long, there was zero chance that I'd be able to make a break for my bedroom door without him grabbing me. From where he was lying, he would be able to reach out and grab my ankle the second I stepped foot out the bathroom. My phone was on my bed, so I couldn't grab that and call for help. Screaming for my housemates, would probably end up with Mr. Under the Bed climbing out and murdering me before they could do anything. But I couldn't stay in there forever. Desperately singing the guitar part of the song, I tilted the shower head away from me and grabbed my towel off the hook, wrapping it around me so that at the very least I wouldn't be naked when I emerged. 
I don't know if he wanted to murder me or just see my vagina. But Mr. Under the Bed definitely saw some vagina that night because I threw open the door and immediately jumped and landed on the bed. He looked quite shocked as I passed over him. And I bounced from the bed to the floor and pulled the balcony door open, ran out and then scared the ever-loving shit out of some neighbours as I vaulted the railing in a tower while screaming about an intruder. My housemates were in the living room downstairs and saw me fall through the air into what they assured me was a very majestic heap on the ground. My injuries were minor, and more importantly, my towel stayed on, so I counted that as a win. I explained the situation to them, and they all ran outside, and to the neighbours, who went in to look for the guy. Mr. Under the Bed had already made a break for it through the back door by the time they got there. We called the police and they found his jumper two doors down, probably ditched because it was bright, red and very noticeable. Come on under the bed guy, get your shit together, wear dark clothes like normal creepers. But not the man himself. Five years later, I've come to tell the story with less horror than I originally did. But now I'm compulsive about locking every door and window in the house even if my housemates don't think it's a big deal. This happened about six months ago. I was 22 at the time, and my daughter was only four. I lived in a two-story house with just me, my daughter, and my husband. I was taking at-home classes to be an iPhone specialist starting at 5 p.m. and ending at 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. My husband had left for his two weeks of training that he does every year for the military. So it's just me, my daughter, and our pit bull mix Mavis. We had just finished my class for the week and had just this weekend free, so I decided that we would go to my mother's house until Sunday. So I pack up my stuff and my daughter's stuff, and we went for the weekend. We returned home Sunday to find someone had broken into our home. There were muddy footprints and windows open, but nothing was missing. I was going to call the police, but my sister's husband explained that the cops wouldn't do anything. Nothing happened that night, but the next day my mother came over to pick up my daughter so I could do my classes without worrying what she was into. They left, and I went to watch the class upstairs. I put my headphones on so that I can hear my instructor teach the class, but I swear I kept hearing stuff downstairs. I even texted my mum and told her I kept hearing stuff downstairs, and it was creeping me out, but she ensured me that it was probably just Mavis, because everything was locked up tight, and no one could get in. I agreed, thinking I was probably just freaking myself out. I continued listening to my instructor teach, and I swear I heard footsteps on the stairs. So I hurry up, take my headset off and listen. But then I didn't hear anything. I walked down the stairs and didn't see a thing. So I went back to class. After my 10pm class was over, and my mum decided to just keep my daughter for the night. I was doing my homework with Mavis upstairs. When all of a sudden, she starts barking and growling and ran downstairs. Now, Mavis will usually bark and growl at the slightest noise outside. So I didn't think much of it, but decided I should check it out anyway. Because of what happened while I was at my mother's. Again nothing out of the ordinary. So I went back upstairs. I was finally done with homework. And it's about midnight. So I went downstairs and called my mum like I do every night. We were talking. And I decided to open my daughter's door and peek in. I didn't know why I did this. Because my daughter wasn't my mother's for the night. Just a habit, I guess. I should have mentioned earlier that when you look in my daughter's room, her bed is on the far wall, a good ways away from the door. 
so you can clearly see under the bed. So I open the door, and to my horror, there's a man under her bed. I just froze and didn't move, and just stood there in shock. After what felt like minutes, I slowly shut the door and whisper into the phone to my mum that there's a man in the house under my daughter's bed. My mum was terrified, and she screamed at me to get outside and stay on the phone with her, as she had my brother call the police. So I ran outside with Mavis and waited for the police to arrive. In about three minutes they arrived and searched my house, and found no one, but discovered my bathroom window was open, and they happened to shine their light at the living room window, and I could clearly see two huge handprints where they slid the window down. The cops waited for my mum and brother to get there, and while we were waiting, they told me about this man that usually stays in houses down from mine with his parents. Both of his parents have a pretty bad drug habit, and this guy has been known to put women in the hospital and trying to kill them. What scares me even more is since we have bought this house, my daughter has been terrified and always told my mom she wanted to stay with her because it wasn't safe at mummy and daddy's house. I didn't think too much of it because I thought maybe it was just a new place, and you know how kids are with new places. After this whole thing happened, I stayed with my mom until my husband came home. We decided to ask our daughter about the house. What she told me absolutely terrified me. She said that at night, while her dad and I slept, monsters came to her window and tried to get in. She says it's a boy monster and a girl. The next day we installed alarms on all the windows and security lights. I can't stop questioning why. Why would the man hide under my daughter's bed? Was he waiting for me to go to sleep? Was he waiting for my mom to bring my daughter back home and I put her to bed? I get sick to my stomach, thinking about what could have happened. My sister is a little than two years older than me. We shared a room all the way up until she was 19 and moved away for college. This is a story of when she was little. A story that she told me when I was little. And one that mother and I still talk about to this day. My sister is now trying to convince herself that it was a bad dream, but she never did like talking about it. She was two, or maybe three, and she had a room to herself, with a white metal bed at the wall in the corner. I know this from a photo taken from the time. They had only lived in the house for two months, when she started crying in the middle of the night. My parents would rush in to calm her down. She would speak of how there was a monster under her bed. Typical kid stuff. My dad would tell her it was just a dream. But my mother, who lived her whole life with strange and unexplainable things happening to her, it continued to happen. Each time, my sister would give more details about the monster. She said it had pee-pee eyes and poo-poo under its nails, she would say, and that it smells really bad. Mother kept hoping that it was nothing more but a childish nightmare and that it would pass. But when my sister started calling it by name, my mother became worried. Her name is Daishi. My mother also owned a black cat. And every time my sister would scream, my mother would open the door and in would run the cat straight under the bed. Mother recalls hearing the cat dash around under the bed as if it were chasing something. Dashi hates black cats, my sister told her. The cat would even stand guard while my sister slept. 
and I have read that black cats ward off evil spirits and demons. From what my sister would tell me, in the night, Daishi would talk to her. It would keep my sister up all night, just talking, always trying to get my sister under the bed. She had a harsh, low voice, and my sister would know when she was there, by the smell. She would look over the side of her bed and see an arm gesturing at her to come. I asked her how she knew what its eyes looked like, and she explained that at one point, they she tricked her. She had gone to her room, and our elder half-sister was sitting on her bed. You see, our elder half-sister lived in Hawaii, but she would visit sometimes. My sister was surprised and happy to see her, and they started playing tag. At some point, my elder sister goes under the bed and asks my sister to join her. It's okay. Let's play under here. Of course, she would trust her sister. So she goes under the bed, and her sister starts tickling her. But then it turns into playful scratching and her face starts changing. I remember seeing the face, but I can't remember the details. Just the bright yellow eyes and the dirty long nails. I don't know what happened after that, said my sister. This went on for a few months, but around the time I was born it stopped, and the monster never came back. But a few years later, Mother was looking through some of her spirit books, and one of the books had a list of names given to well-known evil spirits and demons. She was just skimming over titles until she saw something familiar. There she. Mother said she froze, staring at the name, double-checking just to make sure she was reading it right. She flipped to the section that described the demon, and it said something like, Daishi, a demon spirit that appears before children. It smells of rotting flesh, has bright yellow eyes, and an unknown body shape. I remember mother coming to get us and showing us the page, but since then the book has vanished, and my mother has no idea what happened to it. And I know it was real, because I remember reading it. We still live in the house. My sister and I slept in that room for years. Even as I recount this, my bed is in the same corner, against the same wall that my sister's bed was. I sometimes wonder why it left when I was born. But then again, some weird things happened to me throughout my childhood, but none as scary as the demon under her bed. So my girlfriend and I got a motel for two nights. It was not the best motel and not on the best side of town, but it was cheap, so it worked for us. I was 20 and she was 19 at the time. Anyway, the first night went fine. However, the second night, things started to get strange. At about midnight, there was a banger on our door. I looked out the peephole to see a scraggly looking short man in white jeans standing outside the door with jeans and no shirt. My first thought was that this guy was probably on drugs or something and was probably banging on everyone's door for whatever reason. Whatever. I'm tired, and it's time to go to sleep. Then at about 2am, as my girlfriend and I are starting to sleep, I think I hear the man say something outside. You and your girl are gonna die tonight. Now, I tried to trick myself into thinking that I didn't really hear this. I mean, why would some random stranger say this? 
How did he even know I had a girl in the room? Had he been watching us earlier? All these thoughts are going through my head as my girlfriend is asleep. Her name is Jane, and I don't want to disturb her at this point, and I'm feeling pretty nervous, so I nudge her awake. I say quietly, I think the guy is still outside. She is half asleep and thinks I'm being paranoid. He begins to knock on our door again. Alarmed, we get up and look through the peephole. This time he's standing in front of our door, but looking in the opposite direction with his hands behind his back, almost militaristically. I began calling the police from the motel phone. Jane thought I was overreacting, but I was too afraid not to call. I told the police about the man and they said that they would send somebody out. I called the lobby and told them as well, but they said they couldn't do anything and that I should call the police. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, a police car rolls through the parking lot and then they leave. They must not have seen the guy. Now this guy starts talking more craziness outside. He says stuff along the lines of, man, you called the cops? You're a pussy, man. I'm going to kick your ass. But then he stopped shortly afterwards. We didn't hear anything from him for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then again outside, I hear him say, You and your girl are going to die tonight. Jane heard him this time as well. And she was instantly on my level of terrifiedness. And she hadn't heard before, as she was previously saying, I was paranoid in hearing things. She insisted we call the police, and this time I let her talk to them. She was much more shaken up over the phone and conveyed a necessary sense of urgency that I wasn't capable of. Again, a police cruiser comes through the parking lot. I see the car is about to leave again. Pissed off, I walked outside to the cruiser as I felt safe enough since the police were there and I asked why they were leaving. They said that they talked to the guy, but he wasn't doing anything obviously criminal, so they couldn't do anything about it. The officer said he was messing with the air conditioning in our room, and I explained to the officer the comments we heard the man making about killing us, but again, he told me there was nothing he could do. What the hell? So the cop leaves again. They leave me and my girlfriend alone at this motel, with the crazy asshole for the second time. And now he's really pissed and must have seen me talking to the cops. Again, he's knocking on our door calling me a pussy, saying he's gonna kick my ass. So I called the cops for a third time and about 15 minutes later, I heard the sound of handcuffs outside my room and I had never felt relieved so fast. I don't know what happened and why they finally decided to arrest him. I'm just so glad that they did. I could hear him saying, what did I do? I didn't do anything while they were cuffing him. As soon as the police were gone, my girlfriend and I left the motel. Luckily, my friend was awake at 4 a.m. when I called him and we crashed at his house for the night. When we were pulling out of the motel parking lot, I could see the man in the back of the police car looking at me, the deadliest look I have ever seen. About 10 years ago, I worked for a short time at a small gas station close by my house. Both of my kids had started school and we always needed extra money. I was about 26 or 27 and had not ever really worked anywhere before. But it was fun. We stayed a little busy throughout the day, as there were three factories very close by, and would get a lot of traffic from the employees there, especially at shift change times. One weekday mid-morning, I was working by myself, which was unusual. But my manager, who usually worked days with me, was out sick. No big deal. It was no more than what I could handle. 
There were people in and out all morning, and nothing out of the ordinary was happening, until a transfer truck pulls in and parks to the side of the building. We didn't carry diesel fuel, but it wasn't unusual to have big trucks pull in for drinks or the bathroom or whatever. The driver walks in, tall guy, not unattractive, but a little creepy looking. He had a huge refillable coffee mug and asked me if there was fresh coffee and if I would refill his mug. I told him it wouldn't be a problem. He refills his mug and comes up to pay and starts chit-chatting. He told me that he had a delivery for one of the factories up the street and asked what would be the best way to get there. So I told him, no big deal. It happens all the time. Then he started to tell me that he was from Arkansas and that after he dropped off his load, he was bending back home for a few days. I was just politely nodding my head. Then he asks me if there was a restaurant. I told him and pointed to where one was, but did not come out from behind the counter. He starts trying to chat with me again without going and asks me if I was working alone. And that's when all kinds of signals started going off in my head. I told him my co-worker had to run an errand, but would be right back. He winds up staying there for about 20 minutes, trying to small talk and ask me at least six or seven times where the restroom was. During this time, customers were coming in and out. And when someone would come in, he would walk around the store, kind of behind shelves. At this point, I am trying to maintain my calm and figure out what I need to do to get him the hell out of there. I look out at the gas pumps and I saw a man from one of the factories up the street on a forklift, filling it up with gas. When he comes in, I was trying to start a conversation and ask him stupid questions to get him to look at my face so I could gesture to where the creepy guy was standing behind the potato chips. He didn't catch the hint until he walked out the door and turned back to look at me as I mouthed, help me. He turns around and comes back in and by this time creepy guy had come out from behind the potato chips and forklift guy asks me if I'm okay. I tell him no and he asks if I need help. And I say yes. All of this being said very low, where creepy guy cannot hear. And all of a sudden, forklift guy runs around to the chips and slams creepy guy into the coke cooler, telling him the lady wants him to leave. Creepy guy runs out, jumps into the truck and hightails it out of there, while forklift guy stays with me until I call the police and they get there. I make a report, give a good description, and called the co-worker to come and stay with me and the police and the forklift guy leave. About an hour later, one of the cops come back to tell me that they caught the guy speeding on the highway leading out of town. He not only had an empty trailer on the back of his truck, he had not been to drop off his load and he didn't leave in that direction. And no way did he have the time to get to the factory, unload and get back out from where he was going and be pulled up in that amount of time. But he also had pistols that had been reported stolen in Alabama and had just been released from prison, where he had served two years for rape and was wanted in Missouri for not reporting in for his probation officer after being released. I have no clue why he was in a transfer truck or what the hell he was doing in a small town in Georgia, but he clearly was making his rounds through the southeast. I quit that job within a week and never worked in a gas station again. A while ago, I was staying at an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large Midwestern city. I am a 16 year old female and I was in a room by myself with my parents a few floors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, 
but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night, we passed without incident. Me in my room, and my parents in theirs. I watched a pay-per-view movie, and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. And the next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city, as we ate breakfast in the hotel restaurant. I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I won't lie, as a young, decently attractive female, I'm used to getting the occasional inappropriate look from guys. So I just ignored it, and chalked it up to either him being a perv, or thinking that I looked like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby, and we had a nice dinner, and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend next to me, his eyes traced every curve of my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly, and now it was around 12.30. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel, and once I pushed the button, left. I wish I could have asked him to stay, because no sooner had he walked away, that my creeper came running around the corner and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable, knowing that he would be seeing which floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off at a different floor this time. And even if I did, I knew he planned on following me. So it would have just been a bad move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his. But they literally bore into my body. And I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. But what freaked me out even more was that he hadn't pressed a single elevator button. So he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway waiting to see where I would go. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone, before I told my parents what had happened. They were freaking out, and told hotel staff that there was no sign of the guy, and it was really late. So I just locked my door and tried to go to sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. Now I'm not an idiot. I've listened to these stories for a long time. So I didn't just go and open the door at nearly 2 a.m. Instead, I turned on the light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy and I was near tears, but the knocking kept continuing harder and harder. So I finally shouted and asked it who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I've ever heard. High-pitched, but growly, almost giggly, and so disturbing I can barely describe it. It's hotel staff, please let me in. I was terrified, and looked through the peephole to confirm that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has the habit of always keeping the ringer on. So he answered me almost immediately, and I tried to tell him what was going on through my tears. And what happened next just gave me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode, and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, masturbating. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning, and I still dream about it and have severe PTSD. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mum called hotel security. We pressed charges and the guy is now in prison on what I think are assault 
an intent to commit rape charges. This is a story about my husband's uncle's ex-wife, Jessica, and their son, Jeremy. It is a tale of true sadness and terror. It is 100% true. Neil, my husband, grew up with his uncle and his aunt, Jessica. She was a nurse, and his uncle worked at different jobs. His cousin Jeremy was a sweet little boy. Neil says some of his best memories were spent with them. But something happened, and his uncle and Jessica ended up getting a divorce. I'm not sure what happened in their relationship, because I wasn't with Neil then. I remember Neil's family speaking of Jeremy, though. His dad tried to see him, but there were problems with Jessica and his then current wife. Anyways, Jessica was trying to move on and met a man online. He came to see her and they fell in love. The man was none other than the death angel himself, Michael Kennedy. Soon as Jessica and Michael had married, he became abusive to her, and she filed for a protective order. A member of their family, Jessica's grandmother, I think, had her home broken into. She was there alone, where the police think that Michael and another man beat her nearly to death and stole everything they could carry. The grandmother later died as a result of her horrific injuries. The police has never to my knowledge charged Michael with anything related to the grandmother. Now this next part I was not an eyewitness to. The only people that can tell you anything about what really happened that Sunday morning would be Jeremy, Jessica, and Michael. Saturday night, Jessica's sister stays with her because she's scared out of her mind. But Sunday morning, she leaves and goes home to her family. All's well when she departed the home. Michael then proceeds to break into Jessica and Jeremy's trailer. He starts with Jessica first. He beats her and shoots her. Jeremy runs into another room and grabs a gun and returns opening fire on Michael. It does no good. He gets Jeremy and shoots him also. One shot went into his eye. He was 16. After all this, Michael again steals some of their property. They were found by her sister returning home. Jeremy's body was at the door and Jessica was a few feet away. She calls 911 and when they get there, they discover that Jessica isn't dead. They rush her to the hospital while they pronounce Jeremy dead. He tried defending his mother. He was a good kid with hopes and dreams. But it all evaporated into nothing. Jessica pulled through and fought for her life until she passed away on May 25th. She slipped away to reunite with her baby boy. I'll never forget that day because that was my birthday. That morning at 3 a.m., my back door that was locked and had an alarm on it swung open, completely opening, setting off the alarm. Michael had been caught and charged with two counts of first-degree murder and is currently in jail in protective custody. I didn't tell this story as disrespect to the family or to take credit for anything. 
I just want this tale to be told as both a warning to men and women. Please, be careful who you meet and date, especially when you find them online. Jessica would have never dated this man knowing what would happen. She just wanted love in her life. But love can blind even the noblest of souls. So please, think twice about everything and everyone. When I was about 14, I lived in a small town. My dad was there on temporary assignment. It was the summer of my eighth grade year and we were about to move back to the city. I had a friend, Lawrence, who I met at the local middle school. Since my family was leaving in a couple of weeks, she let me stay the night over at Lawrence's house. Lawrence was a cool guy, but always acted tougher than he really was. That morning, Lawrence tells me that he found a cave in the woods about two miles away. He said, we should go exploring. And in my naive 14 year old mind, I thought this was a great idea. I mean, what is the worst that can happen? And it's important to note that my friend had not been inside the cave yet. So we go to the location. It's pretty far in the woods and very hidden. When we walk in, we discover that other people had been there before. We see beer bottles, potato chip bags, and other convenience store junk. Then, a little further in the cave, we stumble on this area. This is where my note meter just started jumping. The area had a putrid smell and was lined with garbage. I saw a few needles, and at the time I didn't know why they were there. A grocery bag that seemed to be their portable outhouse and a makeshift bed. Someone was living there. I know there are homeless people in the area, but I am on high alert at this point. I saw some other stuff that I later came to realize were sex toys, a bull gag, rope, anal beads, among other things. I'm getting nervous at this point. We are potentially in a crazy homeless person's den. Then the next thing I found was beyond creepy. It looked like a photo album. I picked up the album with one hand and held my flashlight with the other trembling. The first thing I saw were vintage photos of a prison. However, then I saw a picture of a pile of bodies. I immediately recognized that this was the Holocaust, because one of them was a man wearing a star on his uniform. The whole page looked like graphic concentration camp photos. When I tried flipping the page, I noticed two of them were stuck together. Then I saw some gooey substance. It took a second to register what I was seeing, keeping in mind I was only 14 at the time. Then it hit me like a sack of bricks. This man was pleasuring himself to these pictures. I froze in sheer terror because I could never imagine anyone being that screwed up. It is hard to describe the other feelings I had, but it is a feeling you get when you've experienced evil in its purest form. At this point, my note meter jumped from nine to about 20. I see Lawrence right behind me. And before I was worried if I told him we needed to leave, he would call me a pussy. At this point, I didn't care and simply screamed at him to get out now. To my surprise, he just said, good idea. And we noped out of there and didn't stop running until we got home. 
I realised when we got back to his house. He had a look of pure dread. I told him about the book. Then he told me what he had found. It was another photo book, with pictures of women gagged and bound. There was also a picture of what looked like a child with a badly burnt face. Then he heard the sound of someone coughing and moving further down in the cave, although I didn't hear it, and was about to tell me to run. We finally told his parents later that day. The police were called, but the only thing they found was trash, and naturally, nothing ever came of it.